I am here today to take you on a journey. And this is a journey based on my own personal experiences and my own naked thoughts. Nothing I say here today should be interpreted as being the views of the United States government. This journey is about love and obligation towards two different mothers in two different homes. Our journey begins over 30 years ago at a small elementary school just outside of Detroit, Michigan, in the United States. And it's lunchtime at this school. The kids whose parents have paid for the school lunch are very excited because they're lined up today and they know what's on the menu. It's pizza, applesauce, and their choice of juice and chocolate milk. You know most of them will pick chocolate milk. Now on the other side of the lunchroom, there's a smaller group of kids. And these are the kids that were sent to school with uh, a lunch from home. This is what we used to call the brown paper bag kids. And these kids in their brown paper bags will have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, bologna sandwiches, cold pizza, potato chips, good old-fashioned American lunch food. Amongst these kids is one very nervous and very lonely little boy. He's nervous because he's afraid the other kids will see what's inside his brown paper bag. And he made himself lonely so he could hide from them. So as he cautiously opens up that bag, he pulls out a bundled up small towel, and he feels like the eyes of all the other kids are on him, because they are. Because as soon as that towel opens up, one boy stands and points, what is that? It's Bukit Yatha Kastavets. <laughs> Albanian white cheese and bread and cucumber and maybe even tomato is delicious but it's not a very cool thing to bring to an elementary school in Michigan in the 1980s. In America, we have this saying that if something is uh, very American, it's as American as baseball and apple pie. Well, I was as American as baseball, bukadyoth, and apple pie. <laughs> Growing up in, a, in Detroit as a young Albanian kid, and throughout my life, was a lot like having two mothers. On the one hand, I had the United States. This was my surrogate mother, the one that raised me, the one that put a roof over my head. And then there was Albania, my blood mother, but the one I never met and the one I only heard about. Now, in many ways, I was a very all-American kid, okay? That means I played American football. That's the football with the funny ball. I also um, celebrated the 4th of July. And when I wasn't eating Boca Dioff, I loved hamburgers and french fries. I still love hamburgers and french fries. I'm also a big sports fan. So every two years, I was really excited when the Olympics came around because it was either the summer or winter Olympics. It didn't matter because I would sit in front of that TV set and I would look and watch. And from beginning to end, opening ceremonies until the end, it was USA, USA, because I wanted America to always come out on top in the medal count. That was important to me. Now, living in America as a first-generation kid, I was also very appreciative of the opportunities that she gave me. I mean, my parents raised four kids, put them through college. I went to law school. I was rewarded for my own individual achievements. I also very much admired people that served America, like police officers and firefighters and teachers and the military. And my mother, America, though, she had rules. And living under her house, I respected them. For example, you know, she was serious about justice. That means if you do something wrong, you're going to get in trouble. But she was also serious about fairness and equality. That means you'll be treated fairly anyways. And she was about fairness and equality for everyone in her community, whether it was the rich and privileged or the poor and the less fortunate. You see, in America, justice in her house was like that warm blanket that every mother has in their home, available for their kids when they're the coldest and they need it the most. Now, during this time, of course, um, I grew up and I went to law school, and I had the privilege of actually joining the Justice Department in the United States. This was a huge day for me. I was very proud, my parents were very proud, 
And you know what? I was even prouder because I was one of the first federal prosecutors to be Albanian American. That meant a lot to me. Why did that mean a lot to me? Well, because my whole life I was constantly reminded of Mother Albania. And if I wasn't reminded of her, I felt like I was always searching for her. You know, in the first instance, my first language is Albanian. That's what we spoke in my house, even though I was born there. It's no longer my best language, I'll admit that, but it's still my first language. And I also had another reminder. This is not a very all-American name, if you didn't realize. You know how they say this in America? They say, Gajon Junkage, Gion Junkage, Mr. Junk, junk in your eye. If I went to the doctor's office and somebody came out with a list and they waited and they paused and they looked at the name, that's me. <laughs> that was always a constant reminder. And as an Albanian-American kid, though, um, you know, we also celebrated things that Albanians did in Albania and all over the world, like Festa Flamurit, the 28th of November. This was a big deal in my house. Where I come from, uh, in the Michigan area, the metro Detroit area, the Albanian Americans there are very proud, always have been. So it wouldn't be unusual to be walking down a street anywhere in the Detroit area and see somebody with an Albanian eagle tattoo on their arm, or they might be wearing an Albanian eagle shirt, or they might be wearing an Albanian eagle hat. And you know what? You don't even have to know that person. If you said, Kuya Shupe, they'd say, Hey, hey Shupe. <laughs> we were tight. We were proud where we came from. And I always wondered why we were so tight. In Detroit, they would say, We had each other's backs. So I thought to myself, Why is that? You know, maybe, maybe it's a matter of statistics. Humanity right now is about 7.5 billion people. Albanians, we're just 0.13% about, if you say we're 10 million. This is me right here, that tiny little dot. I thought, I'm in this tiny tribe against the entire world. Of course we're tight. Or maybe it was a matter of history. You know what? I knew who George Castriotti Skanderbeo was before I knew who George Washington was. He was a man on a horse with a few loyal people liberated this country from the world's most powerful empire so he could raise an Albanian flag for the first time. He was proud of where he came from. Now that flag, if you look at the course of history, didn't stay up very long. But when it came down, the pride of the Albanian people didn't come down with it. Because for hundreds of years, Albanians stayed Albanians. And they weren't satisfied until the flag went up again in 1912. So you can see that my experience with Albania has, for 40 years of my life, was a very emotional one. It was never a physical contact one with my motherland. So imagine the excitement that I felt when I got the opportunity to come to Albania. And that's what I did a little over two years ago when my wife and family packed up most of our things and we moved to Toronto. This was a huge moment for me. Imagine hearing about a mother you never met for 40 years and walking into her house and looking around and being surrounded by Albanians, my brothers and sisters. The baker is Albanian. The police officer is Albanian. The crazy drivers in Toronto are all Albanian. And I love them. And I noticed a few other things, though, that didn't surprise me. Albanians in Tirana and throughout Albania are just as bit as kind and hospitable to their guests and their friends and the people that visit them as the Albanians are in Michigan, where I'm from. I also realized that the food here is amazing. There's more to eat than just Bukadiyat. <laughs> um, and the one thing that I didn't expect was this mother Albania of mine, she is drop-dead gorgeous. From her Alps in the north to her crystal blue waters in the south, the Ionian Sea, God has given this woman 
every beautiful characteristic you can imagine in this tiny little place. But as I sit and sat with, you know, this blood mother of mine, I was able to spend more time with her. I was able to hold her hand, to touch her face, and to look into her eyes. And the more I sat there and the more I looked in her eyes, the more I saw sadness and tears. And she cried because too many of her young and talented and beautiful children are leaving her home to find homes elsewhere because society has failed them in too many ways. You know, in over 15 years of the Justice Department, I have seen the effects of corruption. Where I'm from in Metro Detroit, I've seen it there too. We've lived through it as well. And I think we've pretty much defeated it. But nowhere have I seen so many innocent victims left unprotected and without recourse in the justice system as I've seen here. Albanians deserve better. I have a confession to make. I spent so many days and so many hours trying to figure out what I would say to you in this last one or two minutes, all the way up until late last night, way too late last night. And it occurred to me that, you know what? Don't be complicated. John, you're talking to your, your family, your tribe, your brothers and sisters. Albanians have different experiences. We come from different places. But when our mother's sad and she needs us the most, we know how to come together. We have throughout our history. So I want to be honest with you and express raw and pure emotions with you. And I have two. One is, I'm very ashamed. I'm ashamed of the few people, as we would say, where I come from, Pafdur, who have caused so much pain and have been so unfair to people in so many sectors of their life, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the education system, whether it's someone who wants to go to school and really do well and be hired because of their own merit and their own accomplishments, as opposed to who they know or how much money they're going to pay for a job. And I'm especially ashamed because they have no more faith in the justice system because it has let them down too much. But I have a second feeling I want to share with you, and that is hope. As I said before, Albanians, we know how to come together. Okay? If a man on a horse can liberate Albania from the world's greatest empire, then a few Albanians, all of us Albanians, I should say, can liberate it from a few shameless ones that want to steal it from within. That can only be done if we all come together. Now look, laws have been changed recently. We read about it in the papers. And we know that our friends are here to help us. But this is an Albanian problem. Only we can take the sadness out of our mother's eyes. And we have to act. If you're in a position to act, act. You don't have to be a government worker, and if you are, now's the time to serve the country instead of those few people. You can think about what you can do in your own life. One thing is for sure, we all have a voice, and it's time to use it. We are many, and they are few. For over 100 years, Albanians have raised a flag. Now it's time to raise a country a country that Albanians everywhere can be proud of. <laughs> Albanians everywhere, and I mean Albanians from the courtrooms of Tirana to the lunchrooms of Detroit. Thank you.